This will be on YouTube, yes. All of the speedruns will be on YouTube, but I'm releasing them slowly to give people a chance to watch. Okay, so again, we see a perk. And I really met the perk and a disproport. I didn't know that the, the, this many 1600s play the perk. And, um, okay, let's go with the Austrian. So Yazazi wanted me to play an Austrian attack, which is F4, where you arrange, thank you, CJ Hamster, where you arrange these three pawns like this. And, and basically the Austrian, the Austrian attack builds, it builds a big center. And, and what you're not trying to do here with white is you're not trying to attack on the king side yet. You're, you're banking on the center. And, and you need to develop your pieces with an eye toward toward supporting the center as much as possible so that you don't overextend yourself, so that you don't bite off more than he, you can chew. And so the move bishop c4 would be a mistake here uh, and a very instructive one. Fall into a tactic that we've talked about several times, uh, which is knight takes c4 and d5. I'll, I'll show that after the game. So we actually want to put the bishop on d3. I know some of you might be looking at this and say, well, what is the bishop doing? Uh, but again, not every one of your pieces needs to be, you know, a a ascending Mount Everest at every moment. It can just be lending some support to the center. And guess what? Because we've positioned our pieces in a healthy way, we can expand uh, even further. Let's go E5. Let's expand a little bit further because that's the point. Of, uh, which, which pawn should we take with? This is actually a an instructive. Which pawn do you guys think? You and we can take with either pawn. But this is actually a very interesting moment. Yeah, so, so okay, so this is really interesting. We can take with the F-pawn, right? And, and the, the, the argument for that move would be that we open up the bishop. And if we open up the bishop, that means we can try to quickly run our H-pawn out up the board and checkmate him. And we're going to try to do that just for fun. But if you want to know what I would have done in a real game, I would have taken with the D-pawn. And after the game, I will explain exactly why. So you guys have something to look forward to. So he goes knight g4. Okay, uh, let's 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 get it get rid of it. Get out, get out, get out. I, I don't want you there. And let's get our bishop out. Of course, gotta get our bishop out. And look look where I'm putting it. I'm putting it on a square such that it overprotects the pawn. And, and, and this move is part of the reason why I would have taken with the d pawn. But in this position, it's not good, or it's not as effective because this is why I put the bishop here. What can we now do? How do we react to our opponent's attempt to break up our pawn structure? The principle is to capture toward the center, but it has a lot of accept. Well, no, if we disregard it, then he can take our pawn and attack the knight. So we can just push. Uh, if we go queen d2, then he can take our pawn on d4, break up our pawn chain. And if we take his knight, then he takes ours. Thank you, Fortuna Chesscoach, for the raid of the party 19. Appreciate it. Okay, queen b6. Uh, so he attacks the pawn. But um, this one we can disregard because our control over the center is so overwhelming that we can just accumulate the pressure and we can do that with queen d2. We attack the knight. And if he takes on b2, then he's probably going to end up losing a piece. Uh, and if he does that, I'll, I'll show you guys how. Uh, but uh, yep. So first things first, he's attacking our rook. So we, we cannot take the knight yet. He's going to take our rook with check. we got to move our rook first. Now, queen. Yeah, why not? Now, what should we do now? And this is the key move. Uh, because if we take our the knight on h6, then he's going to take back. We take, and he takes on c3 with check. So we got to ask ourselves the logical next question, which is can we preemptively defend the knight somehow, preferably with tempo so that his knight doesn't escape our clutches. And the move rook b3 presents itself. The queen has to go back. And now we have our loot. We have our knight and uh, we're up a piece and the rook nicely defends the knight on c3. He's got no fork because that bishop guards the square. And uh, okay, so he goes knight e5. Um, we, we have a choice of several good moves here. We can, we can transition into winning a rook. That would leave him with a... Yeah, let's do it. That would leave him with a strong bishop, right? It would leave him with a strong, uncontested bishop. But we are up a rook. That's that's a huge material advantage. And also remember that we can just castle short. So we can, we can escape the immediate danger to our king by castling short. And, uh, well, actually, if he takes back, he might give us a check on g3. I think he probably will. My guess is he's going to... Yeah, which is... So... 
which is completely innocuous, by the way, and actually not a good move, because the bishop isn't doing anything here, and we can use it as a, well, kind of as a pawn. Now, how should we go about winning this position? Well, what, what jumps to mind is the fact that our king is, is quite clearly in a little bit of a tough spot, right? It's not very safe. So the thing that we really want to do is trade queens. And uh, for that to happen, you might notice that the queens are making contact with each other through the lens of this knight, through the x-ray of the knight. Where can we... Yeah, knight e4. We can move the knight to e4, which accomplishes two things. Notice now that he put his bishop on g3, and that's exactly why it's wrong. Because in addition to dealing with the, the, the tension between the queens, he has to also defend the bishop. So he basically has to either... Well, he basically has to... Oh, Pre-move bishop takes e4. He basically has to either trade queens, disaster, because we're, we're up a rook, or he's got to drop his queen to c7, which allows me to root out this bishop... And, you know, that's a another disastrous trade. So that's it. We, we, we trade queens and we're up a rook. Okay, now let's operate step by step. First of all, well, first of all, let's improve our bishop and let's get this bishop out of the picture. Then we're going to bring our king up. Okay, well, yeah, he gives us the bishop. Uh, but, but if he moved the bishop, we would have brought our king up, activated the rook, cemented our central control with c4, and won the game after that. Okay. So, well, it's not that he had... Well, by the way, if he goes bishop c7, white wins on the spot here with what move? What, what what does white do here? Yeah, full board awareness is super important, like understanding that... And I blundered a piece like this. So, uh, you know, if you guys think that I'm like this immune to these kinds of blunders, I'm not. Uh, I once blundered a bishop in exactly this kind of way where I didn't realize that a rook on one side of the board controls a square on the other side of the board. Um, and you're like, Daniel, I call BS on this. Okay. I've actually shown this game excerpt once before, a couple of months ago. But I can show it again. Uh, this is one of the only times where I actually full-on blundered a piece in a tournament game. My rating was 2076. This was 2006. And uh, you'll see exactly what I mean. This is actually, a, I think, a quite an instructive example. And uh, there's a quick story that goes... Be I've told this story before, but, um, well, stories are meant to be repeated. Just give me a second. I'm setting up the scene. Just a little bit here. Thank you, uh, LMAO Nice, for the, uh, the sub. Appreciate it. There we go. Okay. So... Yeah, so there we go. Yeah, yeah, I'll show everything, don't worry. All right, um, so this position occurred, now this tournament was not actually San Francisco. Let me change that. This was in, uh, Los, this was in Los Angeles. This was in Los Angeles. Yeah, this was in Los Angeles. So I had the white pieces. It's just a position, doesn't matter. I, I was, um... I had just turned 11 uh, 13 days prior. And, uh, you know, we have a complicated position. He's got a good knight. He's got bad pawn structure. Uh, and I've got some pressure to going down the a7 pawn. And can somebody guess what move I played here with, with white? Can somebody guess what move I played here? Yeah, bishop takes a7. So I thought, okay. I thought, okay. Uh, he wants to take this pawn. So let me take his pawn. And he'll take mine, and then I'll get my bishop back, and great, I'll, I'll eventually get control of the a-file. Maybe the bishop will come back to d6. So I play bishop takes a7. My opponent kind of looks at me weirdly, and I'm like, okay, maybe he's surprised I didn't play rook a1. But rook a1, maybe queen takes c3. I, I think I didn't like this. Uh, and, and then he writes down, and this was back when people used to write moves on the score sheet before playing them. I think that's kind of against the rules now, or at least it's discouraged. And he writes down rook takes a7. Rook takes a7. And I started thinking, okay, so he wants to sack the exchange. And, and he's going to try to checkmate me on g2. But he's, I mean, what the hell is this? I mean, because I now have a passed pawn. And then I look a little bit further and it's like rook g takes a7. And I'm like, oh my god, he had a rook there. And this is exactly the type of blunder my opponent made, right? Full board awareness. Lack of full board awareness. But here's the funny thing. I actually made a draw. I'm literally a piece down for no compensation. But I actually made a draw, which is the most 
Naroditsky thing ever. I, he even forced a queen trade. I have no idea how I drew this position. Well, I do, I do actually. He sacrificed the knight for no reason. He played perfectly. But then he, he sacks a knight in a completely winning position. Thinking that he promotes a pawn, but he doesn't. And I managed to hold the position. So, anyways. I managed to hold the position. But but the fact remains, I, I, I blundered a piece in one move like this. Okay, back to the speedrun. Sorry for the detour. All right. So, yeah. So, who didn't see the rook? And that's a kind of what, 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 what our opponent did here. It's very common. So, let's go, go through the game. This is a, another very instructive game. Now, we played the Austrian attack. Uh, the Austrian attack is uh, frequently considered... And the funny thing is, in the game that I just showed you, it started with e4d6. That's a funny coincidence. The Austrian was first played in the year 1850 by John Cochrane. John Cochrane was also the first person to play some other opening we were discussing like a day ago. He was a British player. Very, very strong. Uh, and and he knew he was, this guy knew what he was doing. And it was played throughout the 1800s, but just a couple times. And then it really gained steam about 50 years ago. But nobody really played the perk in the 1800s because people didn't give up control of the center like this, right? It was laughed at. Uh, and the idea is just to get big control of the center, and now you want to defend the pawn. Bishop c4, by the way. Uh, there's knight takes c4 and d5, breaking into white center, and, and, and it's just bad. Uh, we, we've discussed this before. This, this happens in a lot of different openings. And that's why we play bishop d3, and we go e5, and this is the critical moment. Oh, yeah, Johnny Cochran, right. Um, yeah, I just watched people against Soji, actually. So why d takes e5, right? And, and people are looking at this move thinking, like, this violates all the rules. You're not taking toward the center, and you're keeping the bishop kind of closed. So let me try to explain it. And the way that I'm going to explain this is by explaining why I would be worried about f takes e5. It's not so much that I love the move de, although I kind of do. And what I love about this move is that I'm prognosticating a situation where I'm going to put a rook on the D file and it's going to X-ray the queen very painfully. And I can really make, do some work down this D file that I've opened up for myself. So no, this is sparkling water. I'm not drinking a beer at 12, 22 AM before bedtime. Um, so that that's just sparkling water. But uh, the move F takes E5. If he had gone knight e8, believe it or not, I'm, I would actually be a little bit concerned here. Because if you look at this pawn chain, it looks very good, but he's actually threatening to break up this pawn chain with a move c5. And he made this move in the game, and we were able to neutralize this move by putting a bishop on f4 and preparing to go d5 against c5. But uh, this is, as you guys can see, a little bit flimsy. There is a sense in which this is just a tiny bit flimsy and... Perhaps we've bitten off a little bit more than we can chew. So I'm always worried about these kinds of pawn breaks, and I don't like to allow them. And so for that reason, d takes e5 is a little bit safer. Both moves are good. Take the, the advice of capturing toward the center with a grain of salt. Thank you, Vitzkorsha. I appreciate it. Take that advice with a grain of salt because it's got a lot of exceptions. It's among the rules that are, that are I would say, violated perhaps the most. It's not... I don't think it should even be a, a big piece of advice. I think it should be like a... Something that's accompanied with an asterisk. Uh, so anyways. And the dark squared bishop, Mr. Shelby, can go out to e3, which is perfectly fine. And by the way, it stops the d7 knight from coming to c5, which is also good. Which means that the bishop is going to remain kind of locked in. Okay. Uh, so what else happened in this game? So boom, 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 boom. Queen d2, attack. Now he should have moved his knight to f5. He probably didn't want to allow this very ugly pawn structure in front of the king, which is what makes it important. We would have castled. Look at how beautiful white's position is. Center, we can go g4 to make the king side explode. That would be the idea. And uh, this would be crushing. So he takes, and now the key move is rook b3, right? If we take on h6, uh, we win the piece, it seems, but we give up the knight with check. Uh, otherwise, we would have had knight g5 mating him. So we go rook b3. This is the kind of stuff you always have to look for. When, we, when you have a situation where two pieces are kind of hanging, you want to see if you can defend one of them with tempo. And then we take on h6. And by the way, some people might be wondering why we didn't do this. Seemingly winning another piece. Isn't that better than winning a rook? Winning two pieces. But the problem is he can 
make an intermediate move, capture our knight, and we're only up a piece for a pawn, I guess, which is, is worse than being up a rook. Uh, the good thing about this is that we've eliminated his strongest piece, so it's actually not entirely obvious. Thank you, Big Score Show. He should have just taken on f8, right? Uh, because now, we, if we got knight e4, he at least can move his queen back without giving up the bishop. Thank you, B uh, Dolphin. Big Score Show throwing out those bits. Appreciate it, my man. And uh, after knight e4, the game is over because uh, because we basically either force the queen trade or we force him to give up his bishop. Um, yeah, but the thing is, Yazazi, it's it's like your um, you know how what, what analogy should I? I'm trying to think of the right analogy for explaining why this is not that important. Uh, it's like you're, you know. You're fighting a, a boss in a video game. You know those video games where you fight a boss at the end? And, you know, you're deciding which of his toenails to, like, shoot at. But the, the like, huge monster is not going to feel a little slingshot thrown at his toenail. I know it's a weird comparison. We're up a rook, so it doesn't matter. This bishop could be in my grill. It could be... Well, it could be in a place where the sun doesn't shine. It doesn't matter. White is so the, the rook is such an overwhelming material advantage in the end game that barring some sort of crazy difference in piece placement, it, it's not going to matter where you put the bishop. Thank you, Blunderbrow, for the tier three. Blunderbrow with a tier three sub. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's like David is fighting Goliath, and David is like, man, should I sh should I aim my slingshot at his, like, second toe or his third toe? Like, Goliath is not going to feel any of that. Thank you, Nicola, for the thousand bits. My man. Uh, appreciate it. And thank you, Big Scorcho, for another hundred. Well, definitely. I was proud of... I wasn't just proud of Charlie. I was... Well, that was one of my most memorable days in the past year. So we had one more question. Which is, why did I not... Yeah, queen c1 would have been possible, but the downside of this move is that it would make it harder to castle long. So, if, if you compare queen c1, knight f5, takes, takes. Here, we would just love to castle long uh, to be able to attack on the other side of the board. As it stands... Thank you, Nicola, for gifting to photo chess. As it stands, uh, we can't do that. And as we showed in the game, uh, queen takes b2 is nothing to be afraid of. Okay, so let's play one more. Hey, photo chess. And let me just take my sweatshirt off. One sec. Yeah, so why didn't we play b3? Precisely for the same reason that we didn't play queen to it because we don't actually need to defend this pawn because if he takes it he, he loses the knight which is exactly what happened um okay so that is that game let's play one more and analyze it of course he's easy my pleasure yeah we've got tons of incredibly generous supporters which i am incredibly fortunate to have okay uh, let's go Well, it is what it is, uh, X Kyle. People will just have to live with it. Okay, we are uh, seeking a game. We have one against Zek007. Okay, so knight f3. That's the first instance of this move we face. Let's go d5. Um, we've been playing the queen's gambit, which is a little bit boring, but it also allows us to emphasize application of regular themes. So he plays the London, and actually a, a, an underestimated move against the London is just to copy it. People don't do this enough. They play e6 all the time. But if we just copy the London moves, uh, we're going to neutralize them. Now here, does anybody know what typical move is often made when we have a standoff between the bishops? What, what, what typically do we do when we have this standoff? Yeah, bishop g6 is right. Good job. Uh, and, and I'll explain after the game why it is that, that trading is trading is not bad, uh, but it's it's subpar. So we can do the same thing. It's, it's a boring position, but you got to be able to play these. That's part of chess. This is as much a chess position as anything else. 
And now, uh, well, we should castle. We should definitely castle and, and develop. And then we can undermine the knight. How, how do we undermine the knight? What typical, another very typical move in the London for black, uh, which in, in the idea is to, is to, um, yeah, so c5 is right. Undermining the knight and staking a, a bigger claim in the center. Also, you're kind of paving the way for the development of the knight to c6. And our ultimate aim is to, is to smoke out this knight from e5. That is the pride of white's position. That is the knight that we are trying to target, and we're going to apply methodical pressure to this knight. But he's gone g4. So let's unpack this move for a second. It's not a good move. Um, and the reason that it's not a good move is because we can actually win a pawn here. But we need to get the sequence of moves right. So what is defending this pawn? There's two pieces defending the pawn on g4. There's the queen and the knight. And we have one attacker on this pawn. Let me draw it with a different colored arrow. Well, actually, I can't. So we have a knight attacking g4. And we have a queen and a knight defending it. Hypothetically, if we removed both of his defenders from the pawn on g4, then we could win it. So we could first take the bishop and then take the knight. Or, But if we take the bishop, he'll take with the knight. And the queen will remain a defender of the pawn. So we first take the knight. That's one defender. And this reminds me of a movie scene I'll show you guys after. Then we take the bishop. I know exactly, and I've shown this before. I know exactly what to show you guys after this. Knight takes g4, boom, goes the dynamite, and we have the pawn. And we also are attacking. Now, some of you might be asking, I know a lot of people are thinking this. Isn't it dangerous to open the g-file, which is a direct artery to the king? The answer is no, because, because he doesn't have any pieces in the attack. And also because here's another pawn, and this knight could throw its body against a rook that lands on g1. It would just be biting on granite. So as long as we're careful, uh, his king is also super weak. We should we should. So let's actually do that. Let's drop the knight to g6 so that if he puts a rook on g1, uh, that rook is going to be entirely neutralized. Also, we can break through in the center with d4, especially since his king is still in the center, which is what we're going to do. Let's break through with d4 while his king is still in the center. Let's strike while the iron is hot. Thank you, Domain. Appreciate it. That was very satisfying. Boom, boom, boom. And trust me, guys, I know what to show. So which pawn should we should we take a pawn? If so, which pawn should we take? You guys already know the principle about king safety and pawn structure. We should definitely take this one to introduce and let's go after his pawns with queen a5, going after his newly weakened pawns. Now, let's. we shouldn't expect to, to mate him in the next five moves. Okay, so he's... He's just hemorrhaging pawns here. Here's another one. Now we're three pawns up. We shouldn't expect to mate him anytime soon, but we're up a million pawns. And even a queen trade would be entirely satisfactory here, given that we are up three pawns. Uh, now a good move would be to go c4, attacking the knight. He, he might go rook c1. In fact, he probably will. I've anticipated this. And there's a hidden idea. Okay, no, actually he doesn't. Um, now we can trade, but we can make a very clever move. You guys ready for a very clever move? Here's the thing that I'm noticing. What I'm noticing is that if he takes on c6, I know that looks like uh, it might be bad for us because it ruins the pawn structure. But if we play b takes c6, we'll open up the b file. And guess what's on the b file? White's king. There's one small problem, which is that the bishop on g3 is covering the b8 square on which a rook could potentially appear. So we need to both lure him into taking our knight and, if possible, uh, impede the bishop's control of that square. We can do that with the movie five. Exactly. Good job. Now, if, if White is, knows what he's doing, he's probably he shouldn't take this knight. That would be disaster immediately. But there's a high probability he doesn't he, he, he can't resist the temptation. I think he will. The fact that he's thinking is telling me that he sense smells of rat. But on the other hand, if he moves the knight away then our position remains whole. Yeah, he moves the knight away, but now we have a tempo. What do we use this tempo to do? We can use this tempo to bring another piece into the game, such as a rook to d8. And uh, yeah, it's a good move. It's, you know, one of many possible moves. And now we can stick this rook right into his grill here on d3. That's a typical, typical move where it's supported by a pawn. And, and now this, where is this knight going? There is one square that I'm seeing, which is the juiciest square of all time. Forget that I have any pieces on that square. Where does this knight belong? Name a square. And there's a, currently a piece on that square, but we'll get that piece out of that square. No, not before. No, 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 no. Think, think big. Think, oh, 
that square is a family fork against the king, the king, the queen, and the rook. What are our next two moves likely going to be? Knight e5, queen a5. Like, boom, boom. It, it, simple chess. Here comes knight e5. If he goes e4, then yes. Then yes, we might have to put our knight on b4, which is the next best thing, by the way. And, wait. Let me think about this. Oh, we have a beautiful move. We have a beautiful tactic here. Now we're thinking about where to move this queen. And the ideal thing is if we're moving this queen to deliver a fork against his queen, what, why don't we sacrifice this queen for something? And then we win his entire queen back. And then we will end up up a lot of material, presumably. Now I'm oversimplifying this and I'll explain the full extent of the calculations after the game. But we can take the rook. Queen against three pieces here. That's actually super nice. Three bucks from Sucher, thank you. And the reason this seems like a big mistake is because his queen can take on e1. That's where Calc yeah, that's what he does. But I've anticipated this. What can we do? What's the idea? Yeah, so we play rook takes d1, luring the queen back to a forkable square where we fork it and pick it off and we're up in exchange and four pawns in the end game. I think that's enough to win the game. That's it. That's all there is to it. And we're just going to push our pass pawns here. Again, identify the region of the board where you have pass pawns. Let's get this rook into the game and push them while activating all of your pieces. We don't even need to activate our king here because we have an abundance of resources with which to win the game. Uh, there was probably something even better in terms of delivering checkmate, but this was the simplest. And because now we can basically play on Automilet. 100 picks, thank you. Oh, Italians have a very vast history in chess. Okay, let's get this pawn pushed. Let's get these pawns on the road. Okay, let's not give up our rook. Let's give a check. King a2, we can continue pushing. If he takes, we can take with a knight. Because what we really need to promote is this C pawn. This C pawn now has a direct path to heaven. Uh, although maybe not, but yeah, he can he can give up his knight for it. Okay, now we're up a full rook. And now we're gonna start pushing the pawns on the other side of the board. His bishop is just gonna be completely overwhelmed. Okay, so let's first push this one. Then we're gonna push this pawn and we're gonna checkmate him on B2. His bishop is going to be completely... Well, he's probably going to go e6. Yep. Now his bishop is overwhelmed covering this one. And now this is what's called trousers. And now it's checkmate. Bishop literally can't cover both at the same time. Now, um, what we did in the opening here... Now, bishop g6. What is the idea? What is the idea of bishop g6? The idea of bishop g6, by and large, uh, is that if, if white takes the bishop, you play hg, and you open up a very nice little h file for yourself. Big score show gifting to your stem. Thank you. And uh, that basically gives black a very, very nice source of tension already as, as early as, like, move six. Uh, now, why is it not an ideal idea to catch around if you Because he plays cd. And, and the queen immediately gets a very nice avenue to come to b3 and apply pressure on the b7 pawn. And then very quickly... White's going to get all his pieces out on the queen side. Black's queen side is going to get under a lot of fire here. So um, so this is just a little bit nasty. Uh, and, and for that reason, you want to keep the tension. Now, the move g4 is, is obviously very premature. And this idea of capturing one piece, it's like you're standing in line at a buffet. And you're starving. But there's a bunch of people in front of you taking, taking forever to get food onto their plates. And you want to get them out of the picture. Uh, so you take one and then you, you know, blow the napkin off of another person's plate. And then finally, you're at the front of the line and you play knight takes g4. And there is a movie scene that captures this idea perfectly. And I think you guys will appreciate this. Let me find it. Yeah, it's working. Now we can watch that other movie. So Mr. Bean gets in line and he's, yeah, so he, he knocks the fork off of one person. And then he blows the napkin off of another. And now it's a very funny scene because, and now he's at the front of the line. And now you guys will never forget the idea behind the move. Bishop takes e5 and bishop takes e3, right? You're Mr. Bean. 
you're removing the defenders one by one of the pawn on g4. And uh, that is Kasparov behind me, yes. Uh, but if you take on d3 first, then the knight takes. So the order of operations, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, is very important. So we take, take, take. He should have defended the pawn with knight f3, at least preserving one pawn. But he didn't. He actually forced us to take the other one. Now we open up the center. And let's fast forward. And the movie 5 is actually very important, right? Because we're, we're luring him into taking on c6 so that we then get a rook on We can free move this move, rook b8. It's going to be either checkmating or winning a bunch of his pieces or both. Um, so he drops his knight back. We stick a rook here, get the knight over to d5. And now the key move. Uh, queen takes c1. Oh, by the way, uh, if, if he had gone rook c1, trying to win the pawn, like forcing our queen away, where would I have put the queen? What was the idea? What was the, yeah, queen d3 check. So the idea is to d use this pawn now as an anchor for the queen and trade queens. And remember, we are up three pawns. That's a huge advantage. And we can even give up one of them if it means we get into an endgame. Uh, so this is a simple, uh, sort of a simple decision. Probably not the best move, but uh, it's simple enough and it, it, it does the trick. Now the move queen takes e1. So again, if he takes with the knight or if he takes with a rook, our response is the same. We go knight c3 check. And actually, for extra credit, we would flick in another check just to get his king out of the picture. And then we would take the queen. He would take ours. And at the end of the day, we'd end up a piece up. Uh, the same thing would happen. Uh, if he took with the, the rook. But he took with the queen. And this is where it's super important to calculate until the end of each line. So rook takes d1 is the key. Thank you, Rich Impier, for the prime. Getting the queen onto a forkable square. Boom. Fork. Winning everything. So that was the, the game. Well, I appreciate that people enjoy this. I'm 